<laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Perk Up Thursday. I'm Brooke Ledhoff. I'm the assistant director here, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dynamics. So, Jim, let's just let you start off. Tell us about how you got here today. I appreciate that, and thank you for the opportunity to be in this chair today. <laughs> uh, I want to share with you a story of two journeys, if I could. The first is my personal, part of my personal professional journey, and the second is the journey I take my clients on. I'm going to pick up my personal journey with when we first moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. That was 1993. I was invited to be the pastor of the Northwest Community Church in Malcolm. So we bought a house on the west side of Lincoln and I commuted to Malcolm. Now I want to pause and interject here that I really appreciated Ray's presentation last week for a lot of reasons, but one reason was I discovered two things that we have in common. And one of those things is adoption. When my wife Susie and I got married, our plan was to get married and have 12 children. <laughs> Six years and two miscarriages later, we made a decision that for us, parenting was more important than pregnancy so we adopted five children and we had three of those when we arrived in lincoln we loved our three and a half years in lincoln we established some friendships that we've maintained over the years and we happen to be here during the back-to-back -back national championship years of the huskers <laughs> so we became husker fans uh, you couldn't help but be husker fans at that point and we've been husker fans ever since when it, came to, when it came time to leave that role, uh, I decided to transition from ministry to business. I thought it would be a good idea at that point to write a personal mission statement. So on a houseboating trip with some friends at the Lake of the Ozarks, I wrote this personal mission statement. To build relationships within my sphere of influence through which I could help people develop, uh, discover and achieve their capacity for excellence. That has been my mission and my MO throughout my career. Yeah. I was hired by Service Master Management Services and we moved to Rochester, New York, or so I thought. <laughs> That's a whole other story. But by way of two weeks in Shreveport, Louisiana, we eventually wound up in Danville, Illinois, where I was the assistant manager of the housekeeping department for a lift truck manufacturing plant on the graveyard ship. And my first day on the job, brand new career, brand new company, is another whole story. <laughs> but within three months, I was promoted to manager of that account. And then 15 months later, I was promoted again to assistant director of operations where I helped my boss run businesses in multiple states and in multiple industries. Our business was contract facility services. So any business that had a facility needed our services. <laughs> And for that job, we moved again to Indianapolis. And some of our customers in that business were Lifesaver Candies in Holland, Michigan. We had Kraft Salad Dressing and a toaster pastry company in Chicago. We had um, Sky Chefs at Chicago O'Hare International Airport and Detroit International Airport. We had the Domino's Pizza Headquarters in Michigan. We had Kroger Bakery in Memphis and the lift truck manufacturing plant and parts depot where I started. And we were in Indianapolis for just under a year and about to buy a house when a director position opened in California. And my boss recommended me for the position, so we moved <laughs> to Manteca, California, where I was responsible for 15 or so accounts from Phoenix to Seattle, from San Francisco to Salt Lake City. So I traveled a bit and I had customers in that business in the transportation industry. I had Southwest Airlines at four airports. I had Hertz rental car at two airports. I had Greyhound in Seattle and, and Los Angeles. I had manufacturing businesses. I had food manufacturing, Mother's Cookies. I had computer chip manufacturing, LSI Logic and Intel. I had uh, communication systems, L3 communications manufacturing, weapon systems manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, I had Boeing, uh, and I had sports and entertainment. At one point I had Seattle Seahawks and the Seattle Mariners. So I had a broad range 
of uh, clients, broad range of industries in my client base. And I loved doing that because I love what I loved about that was I loved learning about those businesses. I loved learning how they managed those businesses and what their key performance indicators were, their, their metrics for success. And so uh, that's what we were doing in, in uh, when I was doing for Service Master in Manteca. Now, within a year of moving to California, we adopted the last two of our kids, twins, um, and our children self-identify as Group A and Group B. <laughs> so Group A are of Guatemalan descent, all three of them. And two of those were inter-country adoptions where we went to Guatemala to bring them home. And the other two are black, African, African American. And they are uh, 10 years behind the youngest of the first group. So Group A and Group B. <laughs> well, uh, back to the career path. So Service Master was acquired by Aramark. And I survived for about a year before they replaced me with one of their leaders. <laughs> and shortly after that, I went to work for a startup company called GCA Services Group. For that job, we moved <laughs> to Cary, North Carolina, where I became the vice president of production services, which was a cool new concept, uh, combining leased labor with lean manufacturing for national accounts. One of my customers in that role was PPG Aerospace Transparencies. Did you know that they actually shoot dead chickens at airplane windshields with an air cannon? They can shoot up, a, up to a four pound bird at Mach 1 to see if the windshield survives the impact. Because the most dangerous thing for an airplane is a bird strike on takeoff and landing. I didn't know that. I loved learning that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, we were in Cary, North Carolina for 13 months. And GCA Services Group bought a company in California. So guess what? <laughs> we moved back to Manteca. <laughs> Same town, different house. And shortly after arriving back in Manteca, the founder and CEO of GCA Services Group got fired by the board of directors. And the new CEO didn't want to continue managing national accounts as a national footprint. He wanted to break them up by region. So I was given the choice. Move to Houston, move to Chicago, move to Seattle, or leave the company. Well, I had promised my daughter, my oldest daughter, that she could graduate from high school in Manteca. So I chose to leave the company. I was immediately hired by a local uh, California-based company as their vice president and general manager for Northern California. And I was in that job until November the 7th, 2008. That was three days after the 2008 presidential election. You remember the economy back then? That company waited until the outcome of the 2008 election and then chose seven most recently hired, highly compensated, as they put it, employees to lay off, and I was one of them. I was unemployed for nine months. Wow. And unemployment didn't even cover the mortgage. That was a pretty stressful time. We actually lost our house during that, when everybody else was losing theirs too. And, but during that time, God put an article in the newspaper, an ad in the newspaper. That's a whole other story. But that led to the second thing that I have in common with Ray. And that was that my three youngest children, my wife and I packed up and moved to Kunming, China, where I served as the director of an international school, also in common, <laughs> I guess that's three things, uh, for two years. And we had a wonderful time. That was an amazing experience for our family. Well, when that contract was coming to an end, I reached out to the former CEO of GCA Services Group, who by that time had started a new company called Xanatos, and they provide contract environmental services to hospitals. Well, that was new to me, but that was his wheelhouse. That's where he started, and so he had started this company. Well, they hired me right as soon as I landed almost back in the States, <laughs> 
And I was eventually assigned to a hospital in Southern California as the director of environmental services with the mission to calm the account down. <laughs> and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Well, that mission was accomplished, and after a couple of years, I was hired away from Xanatos by ABM to help them help the second largest baking company in the country open their West Coast operation. For that, we moved to Phoenix, where we spent mm, about 15 months. And then that baking company bought and opened another bakery in Modesto, California, not far from Manteca, where my kids lived. And so guess what we did? We moved back to California and we provided a lease labor for that organization in their production line and distribution. And then we also provided a full service food processing sanitation program. When that came to an end, a director position opened up right in Modesto and I went back to work for Xanatos as a director of environmental services for the Central Valley service area of a large uh, hospital system in Northern California. Did that for a couple of years and then decided I wanted to do something a little different. So I went to work for an organization called Pride Industries. Pride Industries is the largest not-for-profit in the country with a mission to provide employment for people with disabilities. And I became the director of environmental services for the largest prison hospital in the world, in Stockton, California. And I had up to about 180 frontline staff, 65% of whom, over 65% of whom had a disability. That was amazing. That was fun. I did that for about three and a half years. And a little over a year and a half ago, my wife and I decided that it was time to leave California for a lot of reasons. We'd gone back there and back there, but it was time to leave, like I said, for a lot of reasons. And so we sold our home in California and bought a fifth wheel RV where we lived for what turned out to be 11 months. That wasn't the plan, but it turned out to be 11 months while I was working and we were looking for a new place to live. Well, we eventually found a house in Lincoln. We still had our friends here. My extended family, sorry, is in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Susie's extended family is in Denver. We have a daughter in Kansas City, so it was a no-brainer. We moved back to Lincoln. That was in October of last year. I continued to work for Pride and commuted <laughs> by air until January 21st of this year. Now, throughout my career, I've learned so much from working in different parts of the country and working with organizations in such a variety of industries and from leading in another country. And one of the lessons I've learned is that it doesn't matter what your widget is. Every business is a people business. And I learned in every industry that if you take care of the people, the people take care of the business. From the beginning, I observed, studied, practiced, and taught employee engagement. I taught it to the leaders that reported to me, my managers at all those different accounts. And I sometimes taught it to the, the managers of my client organizations because they supervise my employees in a lease labor situation. And I came to realize that that's what I wanted to do, was teach about that. So back in 2019, I became a, a licensed, certified speaker, trainer, and coach with the Maxwell Leadership Group. I also got my certification for a, a trainer with the DISC profile. I know we're Clifton Strengths around here. But uh, I, I also know my top five. <laughs> but uh, I'm certified as a trainer for DISC. I started blogging on the subject weekly, consistently, over three years or so. And I, I started to formalize some of that training that I put together and I recorded some training and, and that kind of thing. And that led to this business that I'm doing now, Engage Your Dynamics, where I'm focusing on that. And if you're a business owner with employees or a team leader, employee engagement 
is the most important thing you should be thinking about in your business. And here's why. Engaged employees are the ones who readily give their discretionary time, talent, and energy to making the work better. That's why research by Gallup, Harvard Business School, uh, Dale <laughs> Carnegie, and a host of others have demonstrated an undeniable and direct link between engaged employees and improved business outcomes and what I like to call the five-star business metrics. Productivity, employee retention, customer loyalty, safety, and profit. Engaged employees deliver better results. Now, there are a lot of people talking about the value of employee engagement. They point to the same research and say the same thing that I just said. Engaged employees deliver better results. But the million dollar question is how do you engage your employees? How do you engage your people? And that's the journey that I take my clients on. I help business owners with employees and team leaders leverage five-star performance by teaching them how to engage their employees or engage their people. Now, five-star has a dual meaning for me. I, it, it refers to the five-star business metrics that I just mentioned, but it also refers to that rating system that hospitals and restaurants and even uh, and uh, hotels use, right? To, five star is excellent. So we're talking about excellent ratings and all five of those business metrics. Now I'd like you to imagine that you're stranded on a desert island. Okay. Alone, limited food and water, and no idea how to get off the island. How do you feel? Panicked. Yeah. My clients feel a lot like that when they come to me. Maybe they're brand new leaders and they have no idea what they're doing and they're afraid they're going to be found out to be a fraud, <laughs> right? Or maybe they're a leader that's struggling with some employee issues. Their employees seem to want to argue or gossip more than they want to get anything done. Or maybe they're having horrible customer reviews or maybe losing money in the business, but something's got to change. Now imagine that somebody came along and said, hey, not only can I help you get off of this pain island, but I can help you get to this paradise island where you're getting five-star performance in all five of your business metrics, your customers love you, your employees love coming to work, not only do you not have attendance issues and vacant positions, but you got people knocking on your door saying, how do I join your company? How do I get on your team? How would you feel about that? You'd want to take that journey, right? Well, I help people build a bridge from Pain Island to Paradise Island. And that bridge is supported by four pillars. Pillar number one is determine your place on the leadership matrix. Several years ago, I started asking this question in, any, in every interview, whether it was a frontline employee or a senior leadership position I was trying to fill, I asked, could you tell me about your best boss? I learned a lot about the candidate from their question, answer to that question. But all over, over the years, I also learned a lot about leadership. I learned that every best boss description included some kind of challenge. Those bosses knew how to challenge their people to become and achieve more than they ever thought possible. They also knew how to connect with their people on a level beyond just the employee level. And when you lay those two down on a matrix, you find that people who are high on challenge and low on connection are dictators. <laughs> on the other hand, people who are low on challenge but high on connection are pacifiers. If you're low at both, well, I don't know what you are. I call you an avoider and there's lots of room for growth. But the most effective leaders are engagers. They're high and balanced in both challenging and connecting with people. And I help people determine where they are currently and make some commitments about where they want to be. Pillar number two is raise your expectations. John Maxwell talks about the law of the lid, right? He says that your organization will never rise above your level of leadership. 
And I believe that. I also believe that applies to your expectations. You yourself or your organization will never rise above your level of expectation. I talk about the Pygmalion effect and the Golem effect. Low expectations lead to low performance. But high expectations make room for high performance and growth. And we talk about some tools for understanding where your current level of expectation is and raising your level to allow for that change and growth that you're looking for. Pillar number three is master your superpower. This superpower skill is foundational to all the other necessary skills. I once heard somebody call this skill, which we all have access to, the Clark Kent of leadership skills. They said that because this skill seems mild-mannered, even passive. But underneath, there's incredible power. That's why I just call it a superpower skill. Now, I describe the superpower as learning to see the world through someone else's eyes. Can you imagine the advantage you would have in any relationship if you could see the world through the eyes of your customer, your employee, your boss? How about your spouse or your child? You name it. And you can learn to do that by mastering the skill of listening. And we work on that in this pillar of the bridge from Pain Island to Paradise Island. Pillar number four, develop your dynamics. I call the company and this program Engager Dynamics because an engager is somebody who engages people and people become engaged because someone has engaged them. That's the leader, the engager. And a dynamic is a force that stimulates change or improvement in a process or system. It comes from the same word as dynamite. So these are dynamite skills that will turn you into an engager. There are 12 of them. And I address them and they're balanced between challenge skills and connecting skills. And I address them, I work through them in balanced pairs that I call dynamic duos. So we talk about expect and train together. So expect is about learning how to set expectations for people that will challenge them to achieve more than they thought possible. But I say, if you're going to challenge somebody to achieve something, you better make sure they know how to do it. And training is a connection skill because people tend to appreciate, connect with, and even imprint on the person who helps them develop the know-how and the skills to become successful. And I do the same thing with equipping, training, I mean equipping and, and uh, cultivate, inspire, and solicit, qualitize, recognize, evaluate, trust, and optimize and love. If you've determined on that leadership matrix that you want to be an engager and you've raised your level of expectations to allow room for that change and growth and mastered the skill of listening, the superpower of seeing the world through somebody else's eyes and developed these dynamics, you will arrive at Paradise Island. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? It's, you're still taking I, it all. Yeah, I'm like thinking through the duos. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I always ask every speaker what their favorite tool or um, uh, piece of advice is that they've learned along the way. What would be yours? My, you know, the first time I heard you ask that question, a quote. Not maybe a piece of advice. A quote from a movie came to mind. I love okay. movies. Love movies. My kids communicate with each other by movie quotes. They'll send a text, a movie quote, and the challenge is, tell me who said it in what movie, right? <laughs> so one of my kids has never been stumped. Anyway, so this movie quote came to mind, and it's from Braveheart, which is one of my favorite movies. And William Wallace is about to die, and he says, every man dies, not every man truly lives. 
And there's a lot packed into that statement. And so I, that popped into my head the first time I asked, heard you ask that question, and it's just kind of stuck with me. I thought, that's what I'll say if you ever ask me that. <laughs> um, so you have a lot, I mean, you've had a lot going on. So many Been around life, for a few years too, though. So many life changes. Yeah. What kept you motivated or perked up through all of those changes? Well, my faith and my mission statement. And it kind of comes out of my faith. But that mission to build relationships and to help people discover and achieve keeps me going all the time. And when, remind me, when did you write that mission statement? I wrote that uh, on a houseboat, Lake of the Ozarks, in 1997. Okay, so that was in line with your oh, story. Oh, 1996. Where was that? We were transitioning from the pastor in Lincoln, Nebraska, just before I went to work with Service Master okay. and moved to uh, wherever that was. Uh, oh, that thing? was Danville, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By way of Rochester and Shreveport. Yeah, Rochester that's right. <laughs> um, well, now that you're back in Lincoln, do you have you rediscovered or discovered new favorite local businesses or restaurants? Um, we haven't been back a long, long time to really, we're still exploring a lot of them. Back when we first lived here, a lot of the things that we did was Valentino's and Amigos and we like taking the kids to all those kinds of places. We're back and I, I have a couple. Um, one is Lamar's Donuts, which I brought by the way, please enjoy. Um, and I like Hertz Donuts. Yes. Cool place. Downtown, right? I love the name of it and I love the quirky building that it's in. And so that's kind of, and their donuts are great. So I like that. There's a donut theme going there. <laughs> um, love donuts. Yeah, you love donuts. <laughs> and of course, going along with that is coffee. And I like, I love the mill. I've been to most of their locations and I like the atmosphere they create and the product they produce. I think that's pretty cool. And, you know, we're still exploring. We visited a few others, but we'll have some favorites down the way. Awesome. Anybody have questions or comments for Jim? So what was your favorite place that you've lived in? Oh, well, there's something good about all of them, right? There's bad things about all of them. But the, I would say, and the two that come to mind are Lincoln. Um, the stage of life we were at when we first moved here, um, what we were doing, the fact my wife and I were working together in that and all of that, uh, the friends we made and the, and the experiences we had, you know, of course, the the championships for the, the Huskers. I was, it was just all fun. It was really, really a good experience. So Lincoln is one of our favorite places, which has something to do with why we came back. And then China. We just had <coughs> such an incredible experience there um, that that was a, probably the other one. Yeah. What did your children think of living in China? Mm, great question. I was just talking to Ray about this earlier. Um, my daughter was, uh, she did graduate from high school in Manteca and we went to China literally within weeks of her graduation. So she went with us and then the two younger who were nine years old at the time. Um, my daughter didn't have any idea what she was going to do. She created a dance school. She started dancing when she was three years old here in Lincoln. She took dance. Um, and she had been dancing ever since. And she, she opened a dance school and she had kids from, she had people from junior kindergarten through adults, staff members at the school. She taught lyrical, jazz, ballet, hip hop. She put on recitals. She learned how to go to these places, these little shops in China. You know what I'm talking about? Little shops to buy fabric, to negotiate prices, to have, she took pictures of costumes and she had these, these people make these costumes. Um, she built a business. That's amazing. And the two younger ones, my, my daughter, all she wanted to do was eat rice and go home. <laughs> my son, on the other hand, was bit by the living overseas bug. And he is actually leaving in a few weeks to go to Madrid to teach English. Oh, He's living a life, lifelong dream of living overseas again. <laughs> so that's what they thought of it. That's amazing. Um, if somebody wanted your help with their, uh, with their business, mm -hmm. how, how does that work? They can reach out to me uh, several different ways. My website is engagerdynamics.com. 
My email is jim at engagerdynamics.com. And, uh, or they could call me. Yeah. Um, how long does it take to get from Pain Island to Paradise Island? Is it self-paced or? Excellent. Well, it's designed to be about nine weeks. Yeah. The program is designed to be at not, about nine weeks. The first three weeks are on those first three and it's a combination of some training and coaching. Um, the first three weeks are designed to go through those first three pillars. And then the, the last pillar is six weeks. So we have some training and we, we take, the, we take the, uh, the dynamic duos one week at a time. And so we do the training and then we do some coaching and we have opportunity to put those into practice and develop those. And then there's an option to go on beyond that. Um, so with all of the changes that you went through and all of the places you've moved to, um, <laughs> I kind of want to know, like, how did you keep yourself sane through all of that? How did you, you know, keep yourself grounded as you were going through all these changes and, you know, moving? Mm -hmm. It seems really every couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of seemed like it. <laughs> I well, lost track. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've lived in nine states. Wow. and overseas. Uh, part of it, I think, oh, sorry. Part of it was, I moved a lot when I was growing up too. I went to four different high schools and we lived in different places. And so I think it just kind of was natural. My wife moved a little bit too. We got married when we were 20. And so my relationship with her, my faith, um, really helped us stay grounded. And I think just as we grew up, we developed uh, uh, a mindset of exploration and learning. And so we looked at it as an opportunity to learn and grow and expand our view of the world uh, and our understanding of ourselves and all of that. So um, like you and I were talking about before we started today, I don't understand what it's like to live in the same place for your whole life. And people who have lived in their same place for their whole life don't understand what it's like to be me. <laughs> and that's okay. But yeah, that's how we... And my faith had a lot to do with it too, if I didn't say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what leaders outside of John Maxwell do you follow? Mm. Um, I, Simon Sinek, I like his work. Um, and let me think. Boy, that's a good one trying to think. I've read so many. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of material that came out of Gallup. Um, I love, well, in fact, one of the first books that I used to train my managers years and years ago was First Break All the Rules, What the World's Greatest Managers Do Differently. I loved that book. And uh, I, I've used what I learned from that book along the way. Uh, so I, some of the other ones you know, on the spot, I'm kind of losing. Okay. But, I just wondered if you follow John J. Wen Gordon because he uh, has amazing leaders that you can, oh, yeah, I like that. I'm going to do some more follow-up on that specific. Yeah. You know, you you did uh, email me, and I've connected, but I haven't really started following it. And now that you mentioned it, I think I'm going to do that. Because if you're not learning, you're dying. That's my philosophy. Yeah. So I'm ready to start learning. I'm ready to keep learning some more. Well, and he has some amazing podcasts that go along with what entrepreneur um, mm -hmm. he's just had Erwin McManus on. Oh, yeah. And he's got a new book out, One More. And it's basically like what you're saying today do it one more time mm -hmm. because you don't know, you know, you quit here. If I'd have just done it one more time, what would my life have been different? Or mm. one of the things he was talking about is the last conversation that you have with like Graham, what did you leave him with? Because there's no guarantee that you will see or that he will see you, you know, and, you know, especially with children, right. is this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I uh, just read a post that said, if content is the king of business development, consistency is the queen. And uh, John Maxwell says, consistency compounds, right? And then I just introduced my son. He loves country music. Here's my, my black son, loves country music. He's have, got some friends in rodeo, just came back from Dallas, where he went to visit, see a friend in per, uh, perform in a rodeo and loves country music. So I just introduced him to a song that has the line, it's not what you, what's not what you take, 
when you leave this world behind you, it's what you leave behind you when you go. And uh, so it kind of relates to what did you leave with somebody? What's your, what's your legacy? Yeah, great, great stuff. Um, I'm curious, since you mentioned that your relationship with your wife is what helped keep you grounded throughout all of these moves um, and changes, did, um, did she work? Was she able to move her career around or how did that work? Remember when I said our plan was to get married and have 12 kids? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also part of our plan, and this is her choice, she wanted to stay at home. And her full-time career has been homemaker mom. She's an interior design student, lifelong student, um, incredible woman, wonderful mother, and we've been blessed to be able to make it on one salary. The only time she did work was when she worked in the kitchen at the elementary school where our kids went. <laughs> no, I take it back. Before we had kids, she got more degrees than I did. She got her put hubby through degree. <laughs> Because she worked to put me through college at two different schools. So, yeah, she did work before we had kids. But after that, no, she didn't by choice. Well, she did. She worked hard. <laughs> she worked hard. She worked a lot. She didn't work outside the home, but she worked like crazy at home. Yeah. I always um, am curious about that when you have so much change. Mm -hmm. um, Typically, oh, and it would have been know, very much. Somebody has to have maximum flexibility, whether yeah. it's they work at home or their job, they can work remotely, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. 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 Our next door neighbors, she works remotely, and so they could go anywhere. They just came from New York. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but that's you're right. If if she if we weren't in that situation, oh, that would have been so much more difficult mm -hmm. to try to navigate or even do any of that. Yeah very much the same as far as, mm -hmm. uh, except that we didn't start out at that age. We were each, each going our own way, orbiting around the earth, and then suddenly got brought together. Um, but what we found internally within the family has been reflected everywhere, every country I've been to, which is that opposites attract, mm. and that there are opposites <clears throat> in the kind of business. Uh, who don't realize how opposite they are, and they that usually no that often builds conflict. Mm -hmm. And kind of like you, where I've been, it's always been as a people manager is resolving conflict between people. Mm -hmm. uh, when you can do that, and it, it's, it comes back to know who you are, blah blah blah, right. which is another long long story. <laughs> but it, it's it's kind of the, what I was thinking as you were going through that, Jim was. Um, in China, in all the different states that you've been to, have you come across that kind of situation in, in the different businesses that it's the people who are, it's the conflicts that need managing to drive it forward because mm -hmm. otherwise it's just going to explode because that's what conflict does. I have. And in every industry that I served, as well as within my own companies that were the contract service providers. but. One of the things, and I'm sure you can attest to this, that um, it's kind of like the difference between, and I've never had the privilege of serving in the military, but people tell me there's a difference between the brotherhood of those in the foxhole and the rear echelon bureaucrats, right? When people are focused on a common enemy, objective, whatever it is, you tend to, when people's vision aligns towards something, it gets off of each other and you wind up building a bond Whereas if you aren't focused, and it takes a leader, I think, it takes a leader to engage people in the process of saying, look, this is the objective, this is the goal, this is where we're headed, this is what you need to focus on. And when people focus on that and move in that direction, it pulls them together. And part of managing that conflict is leading people to understand, hey, to inspire them with a transcendent purpose about their work, for example, that kind of thing. That's the team right. rather than the group. Right. Uh, and it's, it's just one of the things I found culturally, as is national cultures, business cultures, mm -hmm. is that if you've got a culture which can bring disparate pieces together, you have a team. Mm -hmm. And like you said, people make the, the company work or not. Right. Uh, 
and it's it's just really it's just layers of looking at how you bring these cultures and people together. Yeah. Um, different labels. That, that's one of the reasons oh, go on. I appreciate your business so much, Graham, because uh, the culture in a baking in a bakery is very different from the culture in a clean room that's manufacturing pharmaceuticals or or computer chips is very different you know from uh, a sports and entertainment type of industry or or an airline for example so the the cultures and i love that you've identified it's not just the national cultures the ethnic cultures it's the corporate cultures and even cultures of departments within the same company and and so yeah it's a great point Which is exactly what you were saying uh, whether you're in the foxhole or whether you're yeah. in the HQ. Right. Where are the cultures? Where are the, and it comes down to the people. Yeah. And that's, if there's a common thing I've found in 40 some countries, it's that when they rec when people recognize that it's the people that count, mm. not the products and services, that's when the business is successful. Right. And doesn't I matter. Found that out. Yeah. Doesn't matter what your widget is. Every business is a people business. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Great, cool. Another donut place, Randy's Donuts. Amazing donuts. You can find them at various gas stations like 33rd oh. and A. They are so good. And it's a local company. 33rd and A, okay. Yeah, the gas station right there. And I don't know who else, I know others, but. Um, Randy's Donuts. Oh. So thank you and no thank you at the same time. <laughs> but yeah, I gotta check that out. Well, you're there for gas anyway. And that's right. Like, hey. That's right. I'll send my father-in-law because he's the dumbest. I I also have a thing for Cinnabon, but the only place I found them in town is at the gas station out on West O. Okay. I I they, we used to when we lived here before we'd go to Omaha to the mall. They had a Cinnabon they at did the have mall. A Cinnabon there. Yeah, and we would actually drive to Omaha. <laughs> to get a Cinnabon. Didn't they just have one on North 27th at one time? Of like a Superior in 27th? I have something like that. I don't know. I, I possibly. I was thinking <laughs> that they did. I don't know if it's still business or not. Yeah. Well, I remember what one of the speakers said, and that was that even though it's a chain, local people either own it or run it. Yep. Yes. And so it's still a local business, yep. even though it might be a chain. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciated that. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. I've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Next week, I'll be back in one of those chairs. <laughs> <laughs> thank works. you to Community Development Resources for providing our Canyon coffee every week. Thank you to all of you, and have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs> have you read the Florence Perspective?